Hello and welcome back to From the Workshop with me, your host, Brandon Hart. We are here once again, not in the Nimble Ink Nerd Lair, but in the COVID style remote, uh, sure, it's a lair, we'll call it a lair. We are going to be talking to Chris Anderson from F3 Wireless. We recently did a 10 week webinar series called Successfully Pushing Intelligence to the Edge. And Chris was one of the guests we had on that 10 week video series as well. By the way, if you haven't checked it out already, there's a ton of really good information in that web series. Look down in the link or the description for a link below and, uh, and check out that whole video series, including the episode with Chris. Uh, but here in just a minute, Chris is going to tell us a little bit more about SAR what it is, why we should care, and whether it applies. Yes, that's right, SAR. What the heck is SAR? Well, we're gonna find out shortly, but first, let me introduce you to my friend, Chris Anderson from F3 Wireless. Chris, tell the people about yourself. Uh I'm Chris Anderson, I'm the CTO of F3 Wireless. Uh, F3 Wireless does uh, custom electronic uh, product design and specializes in you know, all things RF and radio and wireless and uh, et cetera. Uh, my background is uh, RF hardware engineering um, and then everything that I had to do after I got the hardware done, including embedded software and, and production testers and certifications and all that fun stuff and and that's mostly what i tend to talk about with folks these days is certifications and antennas and production testers and all of the other stuff because soldering soldering something to a board or plugging in a nimble lift module that part's pretty easy the rest of the stuff gets a little more subtle as you go along so um, you know, a lot of the topics that you just mentioned are things that we talk about a lot on the on the uh, web series here, um, specifically certification and cellular and antennas. Things are like that come up on on our show here quite a bit. Um, so along with a lot of those certification types of things and radio types of things, uh, is this idea that if you put a cellular device, if I grab an asset tracker and I tape it to my head. So, uh, you know you know how people say that uh, if my head wasn't attached, I wouldn't know where to find it. Well, you could always find it if you just simply put a tracker on it. But what would be the problem with doing something like this? And I guess, obviously, how does that relate to SAR? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what it comes down to is from an FCC standpoint. From an FCC standpoint, um, you, you have what are called modular certifications and device level certifications. A modular certification is a certification for just the module. Uh, and it has specific requirements listed, specific um, uh, grant restrictions listed in there. And two restrictions that are on every FCC certified uh, modular product are the device must be uh, 20 centimeters or more from the human body. And th there can only be one transmitter, the, this transmitter, in the product in question. And when they say in, they mean within 20 centimeters, basically. So if you have, uh, uh, if you had a, a Wi-Fi device that was in, um, in a, a tank monitoring solution that had a great big box, uh, great big equipment box, the fact you've got two transmitters in there with one Wi-Fi and one cellular, that doesn't count. Uh, but if you make a single product that's got two transmitters in it, then that counts. Um, and the reason those grant restrictions are there is because the FCC doesn't know how the end user is going to use this product, this radio product, because uh, it's a module. And the module could be in a uh, could be in a wireless printer solution. Could be in uh, in a tracking device. It could be in a uh, fast data router. Lots of different options. Some of those things are used near people, and some of those things aren't. The, the rationale behind the modular cert was to allow the most number of applications that don't get used near people to happen 
with as little certification as possible. So basically what it comes down to is if there's 20 centimeters between people and your antenna on your product, then you can't, it's not physically possible uh, for that product to violate the maximum permissible exposure or specific absorption rate rules that FCC has set. Your okay. device is going to be fine, ship it, good right. to go. Right. Where things get more complicated is if it's closer than 20 centimeters. Okay. Um, so and, yeah. you just dropped a whole bunch of knowledge on us real quick there. So um, basically what you're saying is if my device is 20 centimeters away from me, I can just shut this whole episode off because none of this stuff is going to apply. SAR doesn't matter. I can, I'm just ready to go. Is that, is that right? Pretty much. And typically where that, where the distinction gets made, um, usage under normal circumstances. So that's a tracking device. Let's say that tracking device was mounted on the top upper edge of a, of a trailer, a semi-trailer, right? Well, that, that top upper edge of a semi-trailer is easily more than 20 centimeters away from anybody walking around, even walking around inside the semi-trailer. It's because it's mounted way high up on the on the top, right? Good to go. Done. Ship it. Um, on the other hand, if that if that tracking device is mounted under the dashboard in, in the the, the, uh, the tractor of the of a semi tractor trailer unit, now it's pretty much by the driver's legs, and so now that device would actually need to 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 go through some additional hurdles with FCC. They can be simple. Um, and a lot of this is honestly just paperwork, dotting I's and crossing T's, because it is extraordinarily difficult to, for a modern LTE device to put out enough transmit power um, in a concentrated enough way to actually uh, have a problem with SAR. Um, mm -hmm. where, where SAR becomes a big issue is when it's a cellular device operating at maximum power and it's actually body worn. Okay. Um, if it's if it's on a belt clip, on a wristwatch, on an armband or something like that, now it now you can start to worry about actually having a situation where you would fail SAR. So, it's body worn, so you automatically know you have to do the testing, but you could fail it in that situation. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so if I literally strap this thing to my head and it's on all the time, transmitting uh, is, at its maximum power, then yeah, it could be a problem. Um, but is it, you said it's just paperwork it, it, and it's really hard to fail it. W what are we actually testing for here when we're testing for SAR? I know you said that, that SAR stands for specific absorption rate, um, but absorption of what and why is it a problem? So the, the first hurdle is, is this concept of maximum permissible energy, um, excuse me, maximum permissible exposure. Um, maximum permissible exposure is this, this math exercise that you go through to, to just do a real basic check. Okay, I'm, my device is used closer than 20 centimeters to a person, but does it even put out enough power to possibly violate the rules? Does it even have a high enough gain, uh, peak gain on the antenna to possibly violate the rules? You go, you do that math. If it turns out that the, that says you're okay, then you don't have to do anything further. You don't have to do any testing. MPE is a math exercise and a certification exercise, dotting I's and crossing T's. Um, it's not actually tested. On the other hand, if the MPE calculation shows mm, you're close to the limit or you're over the limit, now you have to do uh, SAR testing. And SAR is literally testing that has to be done in a lab with very specialized equipment. And specific absorption rate is the, the rate at which um, the piece of equipment is delivering RF energy or just energy into tissue nearby under under the normal operating circumstances. Uh, you, we've got this uh, this tracking headband with the head with the tracker, uh, you know, strapped to your forehead. Um, that's how you would test the device. The device would be would be strapped to a head phantom, which is a, a well a fake head, um, and they would take uh, uh, power measurements using a probe, a, ro a robot controlled probe 
on the inside surface of that head and they would measure that that field strength and knowing that field strength be able to calculate this this does or does not violate the the uh, the SAR limits um, and the SAR limits the specific absorption rate limits are intended to to be um, a reasonable um, a reasonable distribution of energy in the human body. If you have, if you, if you are focusing a, a, a really, really bright flashlight through your hand, you can see through your hand and stuff. Well, I mean, that's a lot of energy going into your hand, and most of it turns into heat in your hand. Um, that heat will build up. Your your body can dissipate that energy at a certain rate and that's the rate it's a specific absorption rate but so, that's you know that's what you're trying to, to, to see to measure so you're absorbing energy uh, so so yes. basically oh so this is what people are talking about when they say that cell phones give you cancer that's what we're checking for is, is that right uh, <laughs> yeah. I had to ask. You know, I had to ask. I know, of course. Of course, we always we always have to ask. Um, um, and then, of course, touches on uh, what we talked about it pretty extensively in the in the last thing, uh, uh, the last series: ionizing versus non-ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation bad. Non-ionizing radiation useful. Um, so light is non-ionizing radiation. Radio waves of all sorts are non-ionizing radiation. You don't get to ionizing radiation until you get way, way, way up into the terahertz. Um, and that's where we start talking, when we say radiation, um, infrared radiation from a fire, you're sitting there warming your hands by the fire. It's not, the fire doesn't cause cancer. The fire doesn't cause cancer. 5G doesn't cause cancer. Um, uh, cell phones don't, ca don't cause cancer. Wi-Fi doesn't cause cancer. Random, ra random radioactive bits of nuclear material laying around, like you know Chernobyl, that causes cancer. <laughs> uh, stay away, stay out of the exclusion zone around Chernobyl, and every, you should be good to go. Um, but yeah, there's there is no way for radios to cause cancer. That whole thing that, by the way, is to to, to this point, that is where the specific absorption rate. Uh, um, FCC requirements came into being was there were people in Congress, there were con Congress people that, that, you know, were being, uh, were being complained to, you know, do cell phones cause cancer? There should be a rule. We should, this should be outlawed. And, and well, that went to the FCC and the FCC is a bunch of engineers. And they looked at each other and like, this is stupid. Are you kidding? <laughs> and so that's why they did it. That's why they did SAR because when, when an FCC uh, um, uh, engineer was asked, you know, how do we prove that it doesn't cause cancer? They just said, well, that's just damn silly. And the most we can do is prove that you're not absorbing too much energy that it's going to cook you. Okay. Uh, so you know, so well, we're actually measuring how much it cooks you then? To an extent. Yeah. Um, and, and the limit is far, far lower than what is necessary to cook you. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> Well, that's good. So um, let's say we're in a scenario where we have done the MPE calculation, and I assume we can link below for more information about how you do the MPE calculation. But let's say we get to that point. Uh, the numbers turn out that we do, in fact, need to go through this SAR testing exercise. Um, is it should we just stop? I mean, is it is it like a deal killer that we have to do SAR testing at a lab? Should should we, you know, just find a different thing to do that isn't going to require us to do this SAR testing? That is really the about seventeen thousand dollar question. Um, so if you have to do all of FCC for an intentional radiator transmitter over again, you have to do the whole enchilada and you have to do SAR testing, um, yeah, about 17K. That's, and that's if you have to do all of it. And realistically, you don't have to redo all of it. For instance, you, you're using a, a, uh, a Nimblink um, FCC pre-approved module. 
that product already has a complete FCC uh, profile that's already done. You don't have to duplicate everything that was done for that uh, for that FCC submission. You only have to to repeat certain speed, certain key parts of it, and and potentially the SAR testing. The SAR testing part of doing FCC testing is seven to twelve k, depending on on the details. The more bands your product supports, the the, the more expensive. Um, the more uh, geographies your product supports, um, whether you're just doing in America or whether you're doing America and EU, um, uh, excuse me, not America, North America, you know, because um, when you do North America, uh, you can usually pay a very small filing fee and you'll get Canada right right in there. Uh, and so you pretty much never would do just the US, you'd always do US and Canada together. Um, so yeah, 7K for typical four band SAR test for North America. Um, seven bands for Europe um, uh, would bring that total up so that you're doing both North America and Europe. That's the 11, 12K kind of number. And you know, all of this is in a, a few weeks. Um, if you're adding, if, you, if you're redoing the FCC ID, because your device is, is body worn anyway, adding the SAR testing is like a week. Hmm. It, they'll do it, they'll tack it on to the rest of the stuff that they have to do anyway. Okay. Um, but the, the, the big over, big message really is um, uh, FCC testing and even uh, radio equipment director red for CE for Europe isn't that big a deal. It, it, it doesn't have to be that long. It doesn't have to be that much money. Um, yeah, sometimes Mostly it can be a little complicated, and that's what we help with sometimes. But you know, nope. it's not something to be afraid of. Okay, yeah. Mostly, it's fear of the unknown. I think uh, for for a lot of folks, because we hear this acronym, that's a thing we don't know. Um, seems like it could be scary because it's the, you know this idea of, of human flesh absorbing radiation and and all these things that uh, that we've heard that we need to be scared of. Um, so. But ultimately, it boils down to seven to twelve thousand, couple weeks of testing, and you said it's hard to fail uh, this type of testing. So, seems like it's it's not that much to to be terribly scared of. So, I uh, I appreciate you walking us through that because I think that takes a lot of the a lot of the fear out of this idea that man, if I'm going to make something that needs to clip onto a onto a belt or you know it's going to be strapped to my forehead or you know put on my wrist. Um, that I'm going to have to go through this SAR testing. Man, I don't want to do that. Sounds like that's not such a big deal. So awesome. It, Thank you for that. It definitely doesn't have to be. Great. Great. Cool. Well, if people have more in-depth questions or they want to talk about maybe even getting help with their specific device and trying to figure out how to do FCC and, and SAR and those types of things, I assume they could reach out to you. And uh, if they wanted to do that, how would they do that? Um, you can get a hold of us at uh, sales at f3wireless.com. Um, you can ping me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, there's uh, all, all the usual ways and such like that. Um, I would say about three quarters of the time when when we're engaging in a in, in exercise like this, a discussion about certifications and, and what's necessary. Most of that we do for free. Um, we, we do that as part of the sales consultation effort um, because if, if, if you just need some questions answered, uh, it doesn't make sense for us to set up a paid project and, and deal with all of that. If you just needed a, a couple of few questions, it's no big deal. Um, a lot of times what happens is there's other things, right? So the first part of the question is, well, do I have to do FCC again or not? Well, yes, you do, but you don't have to do all of it. How much do you have to do? That depends on your exact use case. Tell me about your use case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of those sorts of things. Sometimes it's simple, sometimes it's not. Um, when it's not, that's where we do a, a simple support contract and, uh, and we get paid for our time and we get you the answers that you need so you can get to market and actually build and sell volume so that everybody makes money. Sweet. Yeah, building IoT devices. That's what we're going for. So awesome. Thanks, Chris. So that's how do you get a hold of Chris. If you want to get a hold of us, if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, 
concerns, etc. You can put those uh, either in the comments down below or you can shoot us an email to workshop at nimblelink.com and we'll get back to you that way. Um, but uh, otherwise, please make sure that if you like this type of content that you let us know about that. Uh, best way to do that is leave us a like on the video, uh, hit the subscribe button, all those types of youtube -y things. Um, and uh, I guess until next time, have fun building.